Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nerman, you may continue with direct examination. Good morning, Ms. Harris. Good morning. When we ended the day yesterday, we were talking about the time period in which you were getting ready to move back to Wairika, and you were talking to us about the BMW that was ruined based on the U-Haul. And what we started to talk about, or what we were going to talk about, is the time period in which you moved out. Do you remember the exact day that you pulled away from the U-Haul from Mesa for the last time? Not the date, but do you remember the day what took place? Yes, I had stayed the night at Travis's the night before. The U-Haul was parked down the street and around the corner where there was room because now my car was on a tow dolly, and this time I got a tow dolly that had all four wheels up instead of towing one since the last time that didn't work out. So after we hung out, we stayed the night, we slept in a little bit, and then I don't remember what started an argument that day because we argued several times that month. But we were arguing, and I just remember I left crying. I didn't want to leave things that way, but I knew that he'd call me or I'd call him and there would be apologies because that was always the cycle. So I felt unsettled leaving things that way, but I just thought we'll talk about it later because we were both too upset. So I left. I walked down the block, got into the U-Haul truck, and started to leave. And I thought I pulled up to the house one more time just to see if maybe if anything. And I called him, and he came out on the front porch, and he came around to the side, and we were talking a little bit more. It seemed like things were going to go well, but then he was still upset, and so then he let – I was still crying. And he went over to the front porch, and he was going to go inside, and I was watching him before I pulled away, and he turned around and flipped me the double bird and then walked in the house and shut the door. So I just drove away crying. And you were crying as you drove away? Mm-hmm. A pretty serious fight that day? It didn't turn violent that day, but, yeah, it was serious. I want to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 439. If you could just read that to yourself. Yes. What is that, ma'am? An email I sent to Travis before moving. Maybe I don't remember the date. I think it was late February 2008. And was this before the last day you moved? It was before. Before the day you pulled away? Yes, it was before I moved. What was the purpose of you sending this email? Um, I had kicked around. Well, I knew, and I knew that I wanted to move, but I wasn't sure how to tell Travis because he was kind of reactive sometimes whenever I made exertions of independence. So um, he, I, I sent him that email to sort of like just remind him that, you know, we're not always going to be hanging out like this and doing things like this. We're going to move on and see other people marry other people, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. After you pull away uh, crying, you said he, he flipped you the double bird. Um, you're driving your U-Haul with your car on the back, is that right? Yes, my Infinity on the back. Okay. Uh, when do you next uh, receive contact from Mr. Alexander? I don't recall, but um, I would have called him or he would have called me. I do remember receiving contact from him while I was in Hollister, California, staying at my 
um, older half-sister's house. Would this have been the same day or the next day? Maybe, well, it might have been the next day. It was late at night, so I, I want to say it was the next day because I remember stopping in Southern California to meet with Gus Searcy. Um, if I had driven straight to Hollister, it would have, I could have made it there by the evening. I'm not sure where I slept. I know I slept in my U-Haul some nights. It took me a few days to get up there because I made stops. Um, but it would have been that day or the next day. Okay. When you, backing up a, a little bit, when, when Travis flipped you off, were you mad? Were you sad? How did you feel? Um, it hurt my feelings. I just, I didn't want to leave things like that. He used to say we should never go to sleep angry at each other. And so I kind of, um, I saw it like similarly that we were going to, I'm leaving town, I'm leaving the state. Who knows when we're going to see each other again. Um, he wanted to go do the Pacific Coast Highway and come up and see why we can visit me there and do things there that were on the, the list of a thousand places. Um, so that was sort of a tentative plan in the future. Um, and I would see him at prepaid legal events, but it was going to be a long period of time that I wouldn't see him, and I didn't want to leave it like that, even though we were going to talk on the phone. Why did you care about leaving it, leaving it like that? You had this horrendous fight. You had sex the night before you had the horrendous fight, right? If we didn't, I, I don't remember that night before, but definitely the day of that I left. Okay. You had sex the day of this fight? Yes, before the fight. Okay. What was the fight about? I don't recall the specifics, but we, there was a, a running theme at that time about... Uh, She's describing what the fight was about. The state. What was this running theme that you were fighting about? Um, one was the pamphlet... The speculation that was in the relationship, middle and... We're talking about the day she left Mesa to move to Wairika. This is a very specific point in time. On the day you left Mesa, the day Travis flipped you off as a good boss, you had an argument, right? Yes. You said there were running themes in your argument at that point in your relationship, right? Yes, during that month. Okay. What were those running themes? They were, um, he, had come, he had come clean and told me about Lisa Andrews at that point. So I, I wasn't angry, I was just shocked. Like I thought, I'm sorry. I'm asking for themes. No need to apologize to him, Jody. And I'm going to object to the defense counsel's uh, outburst. There's an objection. The court should rule. Before yes. We I'm going to roll in the objection. Let's not make comments. Ask the question. I'm going to sustain the objection. Ask your next question. He told you about Lisa Andrews. Yes. This is the first time you knew about this, right? No. Yes, Hold on. Man. Someone else had told me the day before, I think. It was in April that this person told me. And you were describing, before I interrupted, that you weren't angry with him? No. Sex not in evidence. Restate the question. Were you angry with him when you found out he was dating Lisa Andrews? No, I wasn't angry. How did you feel? Um, well, by that time, I knew he was interested in Mimi. I felt I felt really bad because I knew what it was like when I found out that he was seeing a bunch of girls on the side while I was his girlfriend. And now he had a girlfriend and I was one of the girls that he was seeing on the side that his girlfriend didn't know about. I guess she didn't know about me. I don't know. And you mentioned uh, Mimi. Is that Mimi Hall? Yes, Mimi Hall. I think she said Marie Hall here. She goes by okay. Mimi. And you said at this time you knew he had interest in Miss Hall. Is that yes. accurate? Okay. Yes. Is this at the same time that he was having sex with you? Yes. Okay. 
why was it then okay with you to be having sex with him when you knew he had this interest in Miss Hall? Well, internally it didn't always feel okay, but it's kind of like old habits die hard. We were still together physically, so the opportunity was always there to act that way, and obviously there's still some chemistry or attraction to a degree. And I knew it was unhealthy, but I wasn't making healthy choices at that time, so I just continued to sleep with him. Okay. After... Well, let me ask you this before we move on. When you were making these bad choices and, and you said old, da old habits die hard, were you under the impression that he was or was not having sexual activities with Miss Hall? Uh, definitely not, was my impression. Okay. They weren't together, was my impression. Okay. As it relates to, uh, you said, you and Travis made a pledge, if I heard you correctly, to not to go bed, not to go to bed angry at each other. Is that what I heard? Yeah, that was one of his philosophies. Okay. So after this fight, and uh, when you were pulling away, or the day that you pulled away, um, w w did you speak with him that that evening then? I don't remember if it was that evening or the next evening, but we did speak. Okay. So you might have gone to bed angry one night, huh? Yes. Well, I wasn't angry. He might have gone to bed angry. Okay. I was very sad. You weren't sad. angry. When he calls you after all this, you find out he's into, you know he's interested in another woman. You know that he was dating yourself and another woman at the same time. He flips you off leaving his home, it again begets the question, Jody, why pick up the phone when he calls? Objection to some facts not in evidence. She indicated that she wasn't sure if she called him or he called her. I think she indicated she called him. Restate your question. Why well, talk, talk to him, him on the phone? Well, he did text me. He did send me a text message. Um, it was either that night or the next. It was a very mean text message. Um, and in the text message, he had a lot of his facts screwed up. So I called him to correct him. What was the, this text message, and we'll get into some of those later today, but in terms of the subject matter, what was he mad about? He was mad about um, the person who had informed me about Lisa. Um, he was mad about, um, he had got into my Gmail account because he had my password and he found instant messages between me and a guy named Steve Carroll that I had started chatting with on ldslinkup.net. It's a, it's a Mormon social networking site. And I don't remember, it was so long. He just, just I, my phone started beeping and it beeped, beep, 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 because all of these text messages were coming through and it was all one single one that he typed out and sent and it just comes through broken up with X amount of characters per text message. So you said something of interest there. You said he got into your Gmail account. How did he do that? He had my... Sustained. Before he texted you in April 2008, you said he got into your email account, right? Yes. Okay. How did he gain access to your email account in April of 2008? She assumes facts not in evidence. She hasn't testified what it was. She just said, All right. got into her email. Cool. You yeah. may answer the question. I gave him my Gmail password and my Facebook password in October 2007. Why? It was a suggestion he threw out there for us to rebuild trust. He gave me his MySpace password and Facebook password, and I gave him my Facebook and Gmail password. Um, he originally suggested that we exchange a password on each of our accounts, and I said, I don't care, I'll give you two, and he said, okay. And I kind of regretted it as soon as I said it, but we stuck with that, so it was two for two. So based on these concerns you had in October that you've talked about, about uh, 
his being unfaithful to you. A deal was struck where you were, you who had not been unfaithful to him was to give your passwords to him as well? I'm sorry, I kind of got lost okay. in the question. In 2007, in October, you were talking about, earlier you talked about how he, uh, you got the feeling he was being unfaithful to you, right? Or that happened during the course of your relationship. Well, I wouldn't have considered it unfaithful because we weren't boyfriend and girlfriend. But his roommate came up to me and said, he see, sorry. It's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. He told me that Travis was seeing other people and it wasn't, that wasn't a revelation to me because I assumed that maybe he was, I wondered if he was still carrying on the same behavior that he was while he and I were official. Um, but he told me that he's trying to date other people, whereas Travis was telling me I'm not dating anyone, but I occasionally go on dates with people. And occasionally he sleeps with people. So I didn't, we weren't together, so I didn't feel like it was my business to know about other aspects of his life there. Um, but at the same time, we were trying to reestablish trust between each other because we weren't sure whether or not we were going to get back together and be exclusive or supposedly exclusive. Okay. And this concern that he was dating and or sleeping with other people, you, that motivated you to give your passwords to him. That was part of the deal that was struck, is what I'm asking. Can you say that one more time? This information that Mr. Hepworth gave you about Mr. Alexander sleeping with other people, that somehow wound up in you giving your passwords to him? Objection, that's the evidence. He was seeing other people, not sleeping with other people. No, she said he was sleeping. Restate your question. You received information that Travis was dating and having sex with other people, right? Well, he, his roommate didn't say he was having sex with people, but because that's what he was doing while he was with me, I assumed that that was the question. She said he didn't say that. Based on that, what did you assume? Based on that, I assumed he was still carrying on the same behavior unless he had changed his ways. Okay. So this information then, going back to my question, said that ultimately then you wound up giving your passwords to him even though he was the one who was being unfaithful. Or I know unfaithful is not the right word. He was the one seeing other people. Yeah, we exchanged passwords. Why did you feel the need to give yours to him is, I guess, my question. Because I wanted it to be an equal exchange. He was giving me two, so, uh, well, originally it was going to be one for one, but I threw out, sure, I'll give you two, just so that he knows, like, I, you know, he can trust me, and so, you know, that's why we went up to two. Okay. So... After you pulled away, you say, he's texting you, he's angry about the fact that you're conversing with someone named Steve Carroll. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And so you made, if we understood you correctly, you made contact with him because, because him being Mr. Alexander, because he had his facts wrong. Is that right? Yes, he did have his facts wrong. Why would you care if Mr. Alexander had his facts wrong? I could tell by the text message that he was angry, and I don't know why it still affected me, but when, when he got to that level, I, it wouldn't make me feel good, and I would just start shaking and get, like, it's hard to describe. I would just feel some kind of trepidation or, or apprehension or... I don't know, fear is a little bit strong, but just um, unsettled. When he got mad at you, you said you would visibly shake? Yes. Well, not at the beginning of the relationship. Okay. But, but, it, but at this point, at the, in April of 08, if he were to get mad at you, you would shake? Yes. <laughs> 
Did this begin, bef did this shaking, did that begin before or after the beatings began? Um, before. The state. Did this begin before he slapped you in the face or in the cheek? It was kind of like the jaw, neck area. Okay. Um, yes, it began in the fall 2007. Before he threw you down and choked you? Before he choked me, yes. Before he broke your finger and kicked you in the ribs? Yes. Before he pushed you down in the room, wouldn't let you leave, and insulted your family? No, I think they, were, they had already begun by that point. Okay. So some of the physical contact had began, and you actually got to a point in your relationship where you would shake when he got angry. Is that what you're telling us? Yeah, it's, it was like my nerves. It kind of like, a, like how a chihuahua shakes. You know, they just kind of tremble a little bit. And you could observe yourself having this reaction in April of 2008, even when you're miles away from him in Hollister, California. Is that right? Yes, I was asleep and my and it woke me up and I began to um, have that feeling. It starts like as a like a tingly, uncomfortable, like nervous, like your nerves starting to just get frayed. Afraid. No, frayed. My nerves were frayed, oh. like just frazzled. What were you nervous about? What was going to happen? You know, I remember now in that text message, he was threatening to... Um, he was just threatening to... He was angry because he wanted to know the, the name of the person that had told me the information about Lisa. He misunderstood and thought her name was Michelle. And um, he said, if you don't tell me Michelle's last name, I'm going to, you know, I don't know. He just said, I'm telling, um, oh, yeah. He said, I'm going to tell um, all your friends and family basically about all the, I can't remember how he characterized it, but I think it was something like psycho things that you've done. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And so, and first of all, her name wasn't Michelle. He got that wrong. So I called him back, and it was a very friendly phone call. I threatened him back. So you threaten it back, what do you mean? I think the last part of his text message said time to spit it out and he was talking about this girl he thought was her name was Michelle, it was Marie, but not Marie Hall, it was Marie. And um, I was, I, what I said was kind of mean. Um, I was, at that point, I just, the way we left and now he's waking me up in the middle of the night with a whole bunch of text messages, they're all unkind. Um, he's threatening me. I just felt like he was being a complete bully at that point, and I was tired of being bullied. So I called him up and I said, after he said time to spit it out, and he just felt like, like he was trying to reach through the phone and still exert control over me, and it was, and I'm in my sister's house and I'm sleeping, so it just, I think I just got fed up, and I called up and I said. What'd you say? It was really mean. I said, um, the only thing I'm gonna be spitting out is the fact that you're a pedophile with a past and something like that, and I was saying, I don't know. At the time, I characterized what I saw as child pornography, but it, I realized it wasn't child pornography. It was just a picture of a young boy. Um, so I think I said something to that effect, and he got very quiet. Did that then end the conversation? No, I felt really bad about it, so my tone turned softer because I didn't like to snap at him. Usually, it turned really bad when I snapped at him, but this time he got, he was a little bit more humble, and he went back to this Michelle character that I said her name wasn't Michelle, it was Marie, and I didn't know that Mimi went by Marie, so he was worried about Marie who, and I described her, I don't know. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't Marie, that same Marie. And so, um, I don't know, we just talked it out eventually, and I don't remember how it ended, but I think it ended up like I was more apologizing to him. It always seemed that way, like our arguments would always end up with me apologizing more, and I felt bad for saying that, too. Okay. 
from Hollister then where do you go? Do you, is this where you meet Mr. Searcy or do you go back up to Wairika? Could you just explain that to us? I think I met Mr. Searcy in Southern California and then drove to Hollister and stayed there one night, maybe two nights, but I think it was just one night, and then hit the road and went all the way to Wairika. And at that point in time, then you began, this is when you moved into your grandparents' house from what you're telling us before, right? Yes. Okay. Now you are hours away from Travis, right? Yeah, about a thousand miles. Okay. You talked earlier about how you felt like he could reach through the phone and, and grab you. Did you feel any differently with a few more days and a few more hundred miles behind you? Um, it was a gradual process, but I started feeling after I moved to Wairika like this cloud was lifting off of me. I don't know what kind of cloud, just maybe I wasn't seeing things clearly while I was in Mesa, or I was very depressed. I was suicidal during that time, and I wasn't feeling that way then, finally, when I went to Wairika. Um, I, w I enjoyed spending time with my grandparents. They're not getting any younger, and so I liked the time that I was spending with them and my little brother and sister. So all, just the associ association with family. Um, I was enjoying, and my photography business began to really take off. Well, I had a lot of weddings booked. Um, I didn't end up getting to shoot those weddings, but um, other portraits and things, um, the market was pretty open there for the taking. Okay. You were happier there in Wairika? I was still depressed, but I felt better than I did in Mesa. You say still depressed, depressed about what? Um, it was still up and down with Travis, so I would feel down at times, and then up, and then sometimes I would do something to piss him off, and he would say, send more mean text messages or um, emails or chatting or something like that. So I didn't like that because I knew that I would still have to see him in the future. Um, as far as at prepaid legal events, and I wanted us to be able to be friends. I wanted us to be able to show up at these events with, with our own respective spouses and be happy for each other. I was friends with my previous exes, and I wanted it to remain that way with Travis. Was that this desire to remain friends and the fact that you might see him at prepaid legal events, is that the motivation behind continuing um, any kind of relationship with him? Well, maybe partly, but it was more the fact that I still had feelings for him, and I still wasn't making the best choices for myself, and so I would still call him, and I would still answer calls when he called me, and we, can, we just continued almost the same thing except from far away. Okay. We heard yesterday a recording of a could only really be characterized, or the bulk of it anyway, as a phone sex conversation that you recorded on May 10th. Were you having other of similar chats of a similar nature with Mr. Alexander when you moved back to Wairika? Um, yes, that's when they started to proliferate. How often do they occur? I can only think of three other times other than that one, and then prior to moving, it had only happened one time. Now, you mentioned earlier this desire to be friends and that your families might spend time together and that sort of thing. Why talk about subjects that we heard on the phone call, why talk about those? Why not just leave it at talk about prepaid legal or mutual friends? Actually, I liked it. It wasn't about the sex. It was more about, I mean, I wasn't having sex, but it was more about um, he was very nice to me. He was complimentary. He said nice things. 
um, even when they were explicit, they were still complimentary toward me. And he was, there were times when he was very mean and then he would be nice. And I just, I craved the nice from him rather than I dreaded the mean. So when he was nice, I liked to, I tried to prolong it so that it would last longer. The nice, be, the nice that you got from the sex, so you tried to make the phone sex calls last longer. Is that what you're telling us? Yeah, I, I wanted to draw it out some so that it wasn't just, you know, like wham bam and then hang up, so that it was actually a long, we used to have long conversations and they were pleasant and it wasn't sex, the topic of sex might have been broached, but it wasn't phone sex. And so now it seemed like he would be very nice to me, but then it would always lead to that, or he, he, we, he wanted it to lead to that. So at times, like the one that we, that you heard yesterday was, he wanted me to get on the phone and, and start talking to him, and we had already sort of had that topic come up that prior, just prior to that phone call, minutes before that phone call. And so I knew that, that would, that's what that phone call would be about. So I did call him knowing that that's what it would be, but he was being very, very nice online and I hoped and that he would continue to be nice to me on the phone. And we're talking May of 2008, right? Yes, that one would have been May 10th. But these other calls, were they was this the one we heard yesterday? Was this the last of these calls? Was it the first of these calls? No, it was probably the third. Well, there was the one the day after we broke up. Um, I don't know how much. I've never done that before, so I was just kind of listening and trying to say some yeah, things. Sorry. I'm sorry. Miss Nate. The phone call you were just describing for us. That was the first instance you had phone sex with him. But this is before you moved back to Wairika, right? I was in Big Sur that day, and I guess it was phone sex. I got the sense that he was masturbating. OK. Let's talk about the calls in Wairika when you moved back in April and, and May of 2008. How many phone sex conversations did you have with him during that time period? I believe there were two prior to the one, during that time period, there were two prior to the one that was played yesterday and then one afterward, I think. What other things, you mentioned your photography business starting to pick up. Did you have a job when you moved back? Not right away. I was putting in applications everywhere. There weren't many places in Wairika. Did you also, was your mind open to the ideas of dating? It wasn't on my mind, so I can't say if I, I wasn't consciously closed off to the idea, but it wasn't something I was seeking at the time. If you were dating another individual at that time, would you have felt like you were betraying Mr. Alexander? Um, I don't know because we, prior to that, I would have felt that way. But at this point in our relationship, I probably would have felt more like I was betraying the other person. I don't think I would date anybody else, um, at least on any serious level. Maybe I'm, I'm monogamous, so if. Travis and I aren't technically together, but I would have had to have cut that off if I were to go forward with somebody else. During this time period, was there, I, I know you mentioned uh, chatting with a man, a uh, gentleman on LDS Link Up. Were there any other individuals uh, to which you had an interest in at that point in time in your life? Um, yeah, there were a few other people. Um, and we didn't chat on LDS LinkUp. We just, we chatted on Gmail, but we met on LDS LinkUp. Um, there was another guy that I was beginning to talk to at the beginning of 2008 on LDS LinkUp as well. His name was Sam Schultz. And um, I wasn't sure where, 
anyway, I might get off the topic, sorry. But, um, well, let, let me ask you this. What about Ryan Burns? What was your relationship with him? Okay. Um, I didn't really have a relationship with Ryan. What happened was I got a text message from Zion, um, another person in the business, and out of the blue he asked, he asked me what's up in Spanish. He was texting me, and I texted him back, and he asked me where I was. I texted him back and told him why Rika, and then he said, you need to come out to Utah. Um, there's some people I'd like you to meet, and I thought people means plural, so I said who, and he texted me back and said I found your husband. And I, I wanted to know who he was, so I think I joked about the future, I, said, I think I said Mr. Arias as a joke, and um, he didn't tell me, but he started giving me, I asked him for clues, he started giving me clues, um, he said things about his accomplishments in the business, and I had just been on a conference call with somebody, uh, with Ryan Burns uh, as the speaker, and so it it matched, and so I thought, mm, probably not him, but I wasn't sure. And so um, I think I asked him, how many letters does his first name have? And he thought that was funny, he told me four. So I'm like, okay, that matches. So things like that, we just went back and forth until I, I finally texted him, I, I said, I think I know who he is. And he asked if, he'd give, if he could give the guy my, his phone, my phone number, and I said yes. And so I think it was the next day, that, or maybe that same day that Ryan called me. And what? period of time would this have been? Would this have been May or April, do you recall? Um, it pro I don't recall. I think it would have been April because I remember texting Zion and saying, make sure you don't edify me as a blonde because I am a brunette now because I had dyed my hair before moving out of Mesa. You dyed your hair before moving out of Mesa. And just so we're clear, is this in April 2008? Or before April of 2008, you said you moved Actually, out. I think it was late March. I don't remember. The, the only reason I remember those dates is because I used to have date and time stamp photos. I guess I still do on the hard drive. But um, I remember the last Super Saturday that I went to was sometime in late March because it was after convention. And I waited till after convention to dye my hair. And I showed up at convention with dark hair and a few blonde highlights. Judge, this might be a good time for the recess, or I can proceed. Whatever. All right, ladies and gentlemen, 125 in the jury room. Please remember the admonition. You are excused.